Good morning. Today is May 13. I've been giving the wrong date all week. <clears throat> I don't know what is wrong with me, but today is May 13. It's Wednesday. It is a great day to be working on our Bible study. It's a um, beautiful, sunshiny day here in the state of Maryland, and I hope it is there where you are too. We are on a day like, uh, I don't know what day we are in the quarantine, but um, I'm just glad to be a, a part of the world today. And uh, I've been on the phone with some sweet friends this morning and uh, just asking that you all will keep remembering people who have lost loved ones. I know, I know people are saying uh, that you know, do you know of anybody who has had coronavirus or has passed? And because uh, there are some people kind of believing it's kind of a conspiracy thing. And uh, I, let me just tell you, as a as a pastor's wife and as a person who lives here in the state of Maryland, yes, people are passing from coronavirus and people are very sick from it. So I hope all of you will be very, very safe. Be very careful. Um, just because you can go somewhere, that doesn't mean you should go somewhere. Just because you can do something, it doesn't mean you should. And so, um, I hope all of you will be very careful. And so, we're going to start today. Uh, I have, oh, Frida says it's a beautiful, sunny Florida morning. It's sunny here today, finally. It's not very warm, but it is it is sunny here today, and surely, you know, it's going to get warm here eventually, but in the meantime, uh, we're just, uh, I'm just going to sit here in my sunroom and enjoy the sunshine until it warms up today. Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your mercy. Lord, I thank you for your grace. I thank you, Lord, that you continue to watch over us. And today, as there are funerals here in this area for sweet loved ones, I pray that you would put your hand of protection on them, that you would cover them, and that you would comfort them. We pray today, Lord Jesus, that you would open our minds, that you would refresh our spirits today as we open your word. In Christ's name, amen. I got a really pretty Mother's Day present yesterday from our daughter, Stephanie. This is the little cup. This little cup. And the little teapot sits on top. I'm not going to put the teapot up there because I've got something in here. And so I'm going to have just a little sip. It's uh, Sprite Zero. Mm. It's Fresca, actually. All right. Are you ready? We didn't finish Psalm 37 yesterday. And so we're going to we're gonna work on that some more today. And if you will open your Bibles, look at all the National Church of God. Men and women on there. Yay. Go National Church of God. Good to see everybody this morning. And so open your Bible to Psalm 37. And uh, I know yesterday I read Psalm uh, 37, 23. But I'm, I'm going to start there today if you will allow me. And, uh, and so here we go. Psalm 37, 23. If the Lord delights in a man's way, he makes his steps firm. So if a man, if the Lord delights in a man's way, he makes his steps firm. He, if he finds us obedience, if the Lord delights in what a man is doing and, and how we are walking and, and how we are talking and the things that we're doing in our life that are true, the things that we're doing in our life that are good, things that we're doing in our life that are right, it says he makes his steps firm. And so that means he guides us. He teaches us. He continues to walk with us. But it also means, and this is why I backed up to this, uh, because I read this last night and it's really good stuff. It, it also, it means he causes us to stand in grace. To stand in grace. I like the idea of standing in grace. When... When you speak of someone being graceful or when you speak of someone being charming or graceful, it's, it's, I like that. I like to be known as a graceful person. And I love when God puts his grace on us. So this is saying in Psalm 37 that 
he causes us to stand in grace. He causes us to, have, to stand in a place that is good for us, that is right for us. And then it says, <clears throat> Psalm 37, 24, though he stumble, he will not fall. Now, uh, a lot of times when people look at Christians and they say, oh, I thought she was a Christian and she kind of stumbled there. Uh, but this is saying, yeah, we're going to stumble occasionally. But we will not fall means we will not be cast down. We will not be cast down. Yeah, I might stumble around a few times, but I'm not going to be cast down. I'm not going to be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. The Lord is, is holding us and is protecting us. And he's giving us uh, an undergirding. He's supporting us. He's just holding on to us. Then David's going to testify. He says, I was young, and now I am old. I was young, and now I am old. So he's saying, I've seen some stuff. I've experienced things in my life. I've seen, at that point, David had seen a lot, a lot of things in his life. We're not exactly sure how old he is here, but he says, but now I am old. But I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. We've, we've got a sure source of abundance through Jesus Christ. Again, we're not talking about money here. We're talking about abundance into our lives. And it goes beyond us and into our children. And I love that assurance. I love that testimony that David says, Okay, I've been young, and now I'm old, and I'm still seeing his faithfulness. They are always generous, and they lend freely, and their children will be blessed. Again, this is these are trademarks of what a Christian does. They're generous. They lend freely, and their children will be blessed. Uh, I know in the past, you know, Steve and I have maybe done something to help somebody out, and within days, you know, our own children will call and say, you'll not believe what so-and-so sent to me, or you'll, know what, you'll not believe what has come back into our life. When we are following in God's example, when we are following in the footsteps of Jesus, then there are things in our lives that God is going to bless us, absolutely yes, but also those blessings will go into our children. Turn from evil and do good. Psalm 37, 27. Turn from evil and do good. Then you will dwell in the land forever. Now, this is saying to, to just depart from it, to leave it, to not try to just keep doing stuff that are stuff that's in your, you know, in your path. Depart from it because David knows that we need to get away from situations sometime. sometimes. Sometimes, God tells us, here's what I want you to do, and here's what I'm going to do through you, and, and we get those instructions from him. But so many times, we get in the middle of a, a, a situation, and we're so tempted to stand there and fight, to just stand there and keep going after that thing. And there are times where God is telling us, hey, get away from that. Get away from that. Walk away from that. You see, if you look back up here, it says, For the steps of a good man are measured, are ordered by God. The steps of a good man are ordered by God. And that means a strong man, a powerful man. There, there is no, uh, there's no translation, actually, that is right for a good man. For a good man. But this is saying, instead, the word there is actually geber, which means the original word, and it signifies a strong man. But even a strong person requires God's hand in their lives. Even a powerful person, they require God's hands in their lives. So there is there's no reason for us to stand and fight in what we think is our own power, what we think is our own righteous indignation. This is saying depart and get out of there. And instead of doing that, do good. Do good. Then you will dwell in the land forever. Get out of that mess. 
walk out of that situation, then you're going to dwell in the land forever. And it says, because the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. The Lord loves us. He's going to take care of us. And because of that, we're going to just stay there in his hand. The mouth of the righteous man utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks what is just. The righteous man is going to utter wisdom, and his tongue speak what is just. That's our conduct. Our conduct shows who we are and what we are. If out of our mouth, everything out of our mouth is foolishness, if everything out of our mouth is just what our, our own thoughts are, whatever comes out, everything that comes out of your mouth is just foolishness. Have, have you ever known somebody like that? I have. Maybe I've been somebody like that in the past. Where you get so full, so puffed up of self-knowledge. If you've, if you've never known anybody who's like that, then after this Bible study is over, I invite you to scroll through your Facebook stuff. Not your friends. I'm, your fr I'm sure your friends are full of righteousness and full of goodness and full of God's glory. But other people on Facebook, man, right now I just feel like everybody is full of their own righteousness and full of their own wisdom. And, and, and people are saying one thing one day and something else the next day. Let me tell you, when we are full of God's righteousness, when we are full of God's wisdom, that's going to come out of our mouth. And what our tongue speaks is going to be true. It's going to be just. It's going to be right. Because look at 31. The law of his God is in his heart, and his feet do not slip. So this is saying, this is saying, hold up. This is saying that, um, Oh, I lost my place. Uh, this is saying that our mouth and our lives, <clears throat> they're supposed to line up. I love what the uh, uh, the theologian Trapp said. Trapp said that a Bible is in his head and another is in his heart. And a Bible is in his head and another is in his heart. So in other words, let me just tell you, anybody can go anywhere. Well, not right now. Maybe they go to Walmart and buy a Bible. But anybody can go online and order the biggest Bible that you've ever seen. It's, it's so big, you can't even hold on to it. It's so big, they can't even carry it. You know, they have to have somebody to help them carry their Bible. Or they have to have a, a little wagon to carry their Bible in. Or maybe they've got it in a satchel thrown over their shoulder. Anybody can own a Bible. Anybody can. And I'm going to tell you something else. A lot of people can quote scripture to make it fit their situation, to make it fit what they think they need to spout out of their mouths. When our two daughters were dating, thank you, Jesus, that's long gone. But when our two daughters were dating, every boy who wanted to date our daughters suddenly was a Christian and suddenly could quote scripture to me. And sometimes what they quoted was not even scripture, but they thought it was. It's one thing to have a Bible. It's one thing to say, I know what the Bible says. It's another thing to have that word in your head, to have God's word in your head so that you can quote it, so that you know it, so that in times of trial, in times of tribulation, when things are going strongly against you, when things look like they're going to overpower you, you can speak that word because it's in your head. But man, another thing is when it's in your heart. Because when it's in your heart, you're living that word. You're not, you're not worried about if somebody comes to you and they need prayer, you're not worried about sending them somebody else's number. I mean, it's, it's a good thing when a lot of people are praying about something. It is. But if you don't have any right in your life, to pray because you are not living what you know God's word says, then you need to get God's word in your heart. In your heart, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. In other words, I know your word so well. I've, 
I've underlined stuff. I've written in my Bible. But beyond that, I know God's word so well that it's in my heart. It's in my spirit. It's what I live. It's what I talk about. It's how I, I walk and breathe and have my being. Listen, a lot of times, if you know somebody who claims to be a Christian and then you know them behind the scenes, you're disappointed. Don't be disappointed in God because there are so many ways that God can get into our heart, get into our spirit, get into our lives. Once you are completely consumed by God's word, then you're going to know that. And then it says the law of God is in your heart and your, then your feet do not slip. You're not constantly slipping and sliding around. You know God's word. You're not constantly wondering, did, is that in the Bible? Does God even care about that? You know, you have it in your heart. You have it in your head. Then you know God's word as surely as you know other things in your life. Other things in your life. If you know, if you know the, the words to every John Denver song, okay? I, I know a lot of John Denver songs. I like his music. If you know every Christian song there is, if you know every verse, every chorus to Amazing Grace, but you don't have God living in your heart, then you're just singing. But once you know God is in your heart and you are singing Amazing Grace, then it says your feet will not slip because you've got something firm you're holding on to. You've got something strong in your life that holds you, that supports you. Then it says, I'm in Psalm 37 today. Um, where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Oh, his feet do not slip. Then Psalm 32. Uh, thought Psalm 37, 32. The wicked lie in wait for the righteous, seeking their very lives. The wicked want to consume us. The wicked want to say, aha, ha, I caught you in my snare. I've got you in this. I've got you caught up, girl. You can't walk away from all this. He says the wicked are always trying to do that and they're sinking their lives because their job is to find us and to destroy us and to destroy our testimony and to destroy every part of us that is good and that is right. But then it says, but the Lord will not leave them in their power or let them be contemned when brought to trial. We are not at the mercy of the wicked. We are not at their mercy. We do not stand under their power. We do not stand under their authority. We do not stand under their control. Instead, we are standing strong in the love of Jesus Christ, and we're holding on to him. We are considered to be one of his victorious dear children. And it says because of that, the Lord will not leave us in their power. Even if we wander in there, even if we drift into their camp, even if we decide to taste and see what that side smells like, what that side looks like, says he will not leave us in there because he will not leave us in their power or let us be condemned when the, we are brought unto their trial. Instead, it says, no, we're not at their mercy. We're not at their mercy. And then Psalm 37, uh, 34 says, wait for the Lord. Just wait for the Lord. So no more self-defense. No more self-defense. Just wait. Wait patiently. Wait in expectation. Wait as an heir. Wait as someone who knows that something good is getting ready to happen. Wait patiently. Wait patiently for the Lord and keep his way. So while we're waiting, while we're waiting patiently, we're going to keep his way. We're going to stand there and we're going to wait patiently. We're not going to be all fidgety. We're not going to be nervous. We're not going to be standing there screaming out our, our own stuff. No, it says to wait patiently because, you know, we know it. 
And then it says he will exalt you to inherit the land. This is the fifth time he says you're going to inherit the land in this one verse, in this one chapter in the Bible. You're going to inherit the land. You're going to inherit good stuff. Inheritance comes to those who are heirs of the king, who are heirs of the father. Inheritance comes to those of us who are heirs. This beautiful cabinet that is behind me on some days, it's full of beautiful china, and some of that china I inherited from my mother, and some of, some of it from uh, my mother-in-law, and someday my sweet children will inherit those dishes, and the, the cabinet itself, let me turn that so you can see that beautiful cabinet. The cabinet itself is exactly like one that used to stand in Steve's grandmother's house. And when Steve's grandmother died, Steve's Aunt Mary inherited that beautiful china cabinet. See how beautiful it is? And Steve wanted that cabinet so badly but Steve's Aunt Mary has a son, Frank, and his son, Frank, rightly so, inherited that cabinet. But then Steve's cousin, Wileen, she is just the sweetest person. Steve's cousin, Wileen, she found a cabinet exactly like that cabinet. Exactly like that cabinet. Except it was a different color, and it didn't have these beautiful paintings on the door. And Steve's cousin, Wileen, bought that cabinet painted it, got pictures of the design on the thing, and she completely replicated what that cabinet looked like down to the red knobs on the drawers. It is exactly identical to the cabinet that is now in Frank's home down in Texas. And then she called me and she called Steve and she said, here's what I've done. And if you don't want it, I understand. But if you do want it, I'd like to give it to you. And I said, no way. I'm, so I purchased. I, I didn't pay what all she paid because she put all that work into it, painting it. And doing those beautiful freehand uh, sketches, just like the grandmother. And I'm just going to tell you, this sits in my home. And even though it did not come out of Steve's grandmother's home, he treasures this inheritance. When, when you are an heir and you inherit something, you treasure it. You treasure it. And so for David to say to us five different times just in this chapter, you're going to get an inheritance. Wait patiently for it. Wait patiently for it. Wait in expectation for it. I couldn't wait to get down to Cleveland and pick up this cabinet after Wileen had redone it. We waited patiently, and therefore we, I mean, we just, we just waited patiently. It says, he will exalt you to inherit the land. He will raise you up for that inheritance. You will get that inheritance. And, and someday, one of my children, I'm sure, will inherit this cabinet. And they're waiting patiently. They're waiting expectantly. I hope they're waiting patiently because it's going to be a while. Then it says, <clears throat> you will inherit the land. And it says that five times. That's the fifth time it says it. But then it is also the fifth time it says, when the wicked are cut off, you will see that too. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. When your enemies are, are removed, when your enemies are cut off from the land of inheritance, you're going to see that too. And then it says in 37, 35, I have seen a wicked and ruthless man. He was flourishing like a green tree in its native soil. So doing very well. Lots of branches, lots of greenery, looking fine. But he soon passed away and was no more. His season passed. And instead of going to a, into a season of inheritance then, once his season had passed, he said, I looked for him, but I, he couldn't even be found. Everything that he was, everything that he left, everything that he uh, could possibly have owned is cut off and nothing is left. Nothing is left. There's no beautiful cabinet left afterwards. 
There's no money left afterwards. There's no uh, something to pass down to his children. He's just cut off and you can't even find him anymore. No sign left of him. Because when God cuts you off, you are cut off. Your enemy is destroyed. And then it says, now just think about this, is what David is saying. Psalm 37, 37. Just, he's saying, consider this. Think about the blameless. Observe the upright. Get your mind off. Get your thoughts off these who, who are in a mess. He's, he's saying, let's, let's look at the blameless today. Let's look at the upright. Let's look at the things in our lives, the people in our lives who are not doing evil. Let's not look at those people. I know there's a lot of stuff going on right now. And it's in the news, and, and we all know people are messing up and causing confusion. And, and David is saying, let's just not look at those. Let's look at the upright. Let's look at the blameless. Let's look at the good people. And then it says, uh, because there's a future for the man of peace. Those are people who are living in peace. Those people who are not constantly in strife with someone. There's a future for them. Man, that's what I want. I want. I want that in my life. I want to be a man of peace. I want my children to be people of peace. Because there's a future. There's posterity for those people. So David has said so many times, Let's just not worry about these wicked people. And he says it for the last time, number six, but all sinners will be destroyed. The future of the wicked will be cut off. He says it six times. A man of peace, he's got posterity. He's got a future. But the future for a man who is wicked or evil, but sinners, they're going to be destroyed and there will be no peace for them and they will be cut off. Then in Psalm 37, 39, the salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. Hey, it doesn't come from us. It does not come from us. It doesn't come from that man who says, I can save you. It doesn't come from that woman says, honey, I am your future. This is saying God is our salvation. And only through his salvation can we become righteous. And it says he's our stronghold in time of trouble. He's our place of deliverance. The Lord helps them and he delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked. He saves them because they take refuge in him because he gives us a place of security because we are his heir. We are his heir. We have that place of security. I'm his heir. He's going to leave me things. He's going to, he's going to give things to me. He's going to, he's, yes, he's just going to take the wicked and he's just going to boom them out of the way. Just knock them out of the way. Just move them. When you allow God to become the buffer in your life, when you allow God to stand between you and everything that is evil in your life, everything that is bad in your life, when you allow God to come into your heart, come into your head, to change you, to make him your place of refuge, not crawling under the covers with a Xanax and a Harlequin romance. When you allow God to be the strong driving force in your life, and I'm going to just tell you, I too have been young, and now I am older. I hope I'm not old yet, but I am older than when I used to be. And I've seen a lot of stuff in my life. And I know this for sure, that it is always better to go to a place of refuge it is always better to go to a place of trust. It is always better to wait patiently before the Lord. It is always better to see what the Lord has for me because my future in the Lord is a place of peace. I just, I just need a place of peace. 
I counsel with a lot of people, and I know this for a fact, a lot of people need peace right now. I need peace right now. I need peace right now. And so, all these things that are going on in my life personally, you know, I could, <clears throat> I could just say, that, forget it, I'm just... I'm just overwhelmed. I'm just overwhelmed. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed. But instead, I'm going to say, well, here's what I know. I know God is my past. I know he's my present. I know he's in my future. I know tomorrow will look better than today because I've lived many days. And yes, sometimes... Grieving endures for the night, but joy does come in the morning. Peace comes into our lives when Jesus comes into our lives. <clears throat> Love comes into our lives when Jesus comes into our life. Grace comes into our life when Jesus comes into our life. And if you think you don't have anything to live for, I encourage you to become a child of God today. To allow Christ into your life today. Because through Jesus Christ, we get an inheritance. We get eternal life. We get salvation. But we also get a strong hand right now. On May 13, 2020, in the middle of what on earth is going on. I don't know what all on earth is going on, but I do know that in heaven, God is in still enthroned on the throne and that in heaven, he is still in control of everything. I love you so much. I'm praying for you. I hope you're praying for us too. This is indeed a difficult time. On Friday morning, we will bury my sweet, sweet friend, Karen Woods. Karen had cancer. Some of you uh, ask about that. Karen has had cancer. And in 2017, Karen went to Israel with us. Yes, there's people mowing my neighbor's grass. In 2017, Karen went to Israel with us, and she enjoyed the trip so much, and she was strong, and she was healthy, and she was happy, and she loved it. She loved every minute of it. And then she came home and just... A month or two later, she was diagnosed with cancer. And let me just tell you, Karen has fought the fight. Karen has fought the fight. And now she is victorious standing in front of Jesus Christ. She is victorious standing there. No more suffering for Karen. No more medication for Karen. But I do pray that you would please remember Jeff, her husband Jeff, Serena, Alex, and Joel are her children. And so remember them and remember all of those who loved Karen so much. Father, today, we put our lives in your hands. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to give us revelation through your word, because it is through that revelation that we find your word, that we know your word. And Lord, we can stand on that word. I thank you, Lord, for your peace that passes all understanding, for your joy that bubbles out of us like living water. And Lord, as we live in peace and we live in joy, we do so to go out and testify to others. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. I love you. I'm going to let this guy finish up my neighbor's yard, and maybe he'll make a mistake and come over into my yard. Love you guys. Bye-bye.